Hi, everyone, and hi, everybody online. Um, I want to start by thanking my committee, John Fleck from University of New Mexico, Keiko Mertz from Friends of the River, Tom Coringham from here at Scripps, and my chair, Dan Cayenne, also here from Scripps. Today, I'm going to be talking about Colorado's reliant, or California's reliance on the Colorado River. Although my research involved a lot of data analysis, I wanted to use this as an opportunity to tell the story of the Colorado River in relation to the current news that many of you may be familiar with. The Colorado River has been making major headlines for about a year and a half. Beginning in July 2022, when Colorado River reservoirs reached such dangerously low levels that the federal government told the states that rely on the water to agree, agree on cuts between themselves. By January 2023, the deadline had come and gone, and the states had still not reached an agreement on how cuts would be distributed. By April 2023, with no agreement among the states, the federal government began to propose mandated reductions across all states. This would be a historic decision, as water rights for the Colorado are already a contentious topic. That brings us to May 22, 2023, when headlines around the country released news of the newest agreement, touting it to be a breakthrough deal for the Colorado River. The agreement is between the federal government and the lower basin states of California, Arizona, and Nevada to make compensated cuts paid for by the Inflation Reduction Act at an estimated $1.2 billion. The agreement promises to conserve 3 million acre feet of water by 2026 when the agreement expires. I'll get more into the details of this agreement later, but first it's important to understand how the Colorado River reached such a dire situation to begin with. This is Lake Powell, one of the two major reservoirs on the Colorado River. You can see the notorious bathtub, bathtub line that marks just how much water level has decreased. Visiting Lake Powell each year is actually how I first became interested in, in the Colorado River, with that bathtub line towering nearly 200 feet over my head, which showed where the water had been even just in my parents' lifetime. I always wondered how the water had gotten so low and why with each year it didn't seem to be returning to previous levels. A recent study found that the 2000 to 2021 period was the driest two decades in more than a thousand years in the West as a result of human-caused climate change. We can see the evidence of this when we compare the Western US drought monitor from September 2000 to September of last year. And for reference, this is where the Colorado River Basin is. We can see that areas that didn't have any drought have at least become abnormally moderate and in some cases, extreme drought. This graph shows the combined storage of Lake Mead and Lake Powell dating back to around 1940. There's an obvious decline in storage over the past 20 years as a result of the persistent drought. And although climate change has had a huge effect on reservoir levels, it's not the only contributor to the crisis. The Colorado River is one of those regulated rivers in the world, governed by a series of laws and policies bound up in what is referred to as the law of the river. The law of the river dates back to 1922, when the Bureau of Reclamation divided the river basin into the upper basin states and the lower basin states, granting each basin 7.5 million acre feet of water and 1.5 million acre feet to Mexico for a total of 16 million acre feet of water per year coming from the Colorado River. For reference, one acre feet is equal to about 350,000 gallons of water. The amount of water divided up was based on flow estimations from an unusually wet couple of decades in the early 1900s, leading to an overcommitment of water between 2,000 acre feet and 4 million acre feet per year. Overall, the demand of the river far outweighs the supply. Ron Stork, a leading expert and senior policy director at Friends of the River, called this the, cr the cruel arithmetic of the Colorado River. California was not only granted the largest share of the river under the law of the river, but it also has the most senior rights, which means that in times of shortage, states like Nevada and Arizona could see their entire supply cut before California has to spare even a drop. And within California, four water districts four dominate water imports from the Colorado River. Metropolitan District is located on the coast and spans from San Diego to Ventura County, Water, water use in this area is largely municipal. 
Coachella Valley Water District, Imperial, uh, Imperial Irrigation District, and Palo Verde Irrigation District are all located in the rural agricultural region of Southern California. Water in these regions is driven by agriculture. In fact, 80% of California's share from the Colorado River is used for agriculture. This is equal to 3.85 million acre feet of their 4.4 million acre feet allotment, which is just about what the entire state of Colorado gets from the river. Out of the three agriculture districts, one district gets the majority of the water. Imperial Irrigation District is located just north of the US-Mexico border. It's an extremely arid landscape irrigated by water that comes exclusively from the Colorado River. Out of the 3.85 million acre feet that goes to agriculture, Imperial Irrigation District has rights to 3.1 million acre feet, which is more than the state of Arizona's share of the river. This plot highlights how much more water Imperial uses than other districts. The blue line on top shows the total amount of water delivered from Colorado, the Colorado River to all California users dating back to 1964. The orange line shows the amount of water delivered to Imperial County alone, and the yellow line shows Metropolitan Water District, which includes cities like San Diego and Los Angeles. The black dash line represents California's annual allowance of 4.4 million acre feet. You can see that for many years, California was using far more than its share. That's why in 2003, the Quantification Settlement Agreement was implemented, which mandated that California cease to use more than its share of the river. We can look at the 2002 to 2003 period to see the effects of huge redu reductions in water supply to Southern California. In total, California had to reduce its water from the Colorado by about one-fifth. In Imperial Irrigation District, that only meant about 6% of their water got cut. But for Metropolitan Water District, it was closer to half. Another expert that I worked with, John Fleck, mentions that one of the most impressive aspects of this is that if you were living in LA or San Diego at the time, you weren't even aware that this happened because Metropolitan had been so prepared to make these cuts. So why, as the largest user of water, did Imperial only have to take such a small cut? California water governance is built to protect the agriculture industry. A first-in-time, first-in-right clause establishes that the first user to put water to a beneficial use gets that amount of water for that purpose for eternity. This grants rights to the first water users, who in California are agriculture users. Present perfected clause establishes seniority, which means that users with younger rights see reductions before senior users. This means that agriculture districts are spared in years of shortages, as we saw with Metropolitan Water District. Lastly is the use it or lose it clause, which establishes that water rights can be reduced if not used to their full extent. This disincentivizes users to conserve water and it actually incentivizes them to use more. These principles allow the naturally arid landscape of Southern California to be replaced by crop fields. To understand the situation more fully, I looked at crop production in Imperial County. I found that alfalfa is the most abundantly, abundantly grown crop with nearly 160,000 acres produced per year. In comparison, crops like lettuce, broccoli, and onions, things that we would buy at a grocery store, are grown at a scale closer to 20,000 acres per year. Not only is it more abundant, alfalfa consumes more water per acre than any of the other crops grown and almost double produce crops like lettuce. I then removed alfalfa from the graph on the right to seep the produce crops at a better scale. And we can see that when water reductions happened in 2003, even at just that 6% level for Imperial County, um, alfalfa production decreased. Food production, however, increased. This is important because supporters of corporate agriculture often say that reduction in California's share of water from the Colorado River would lead to food production shortages. This, however, does not appear to be the case from the data. Supporters of corporate agriculture also say that reducing California's water supply will harm the farmers due to fields that go to fallow. Fallowing a field means to not farm it for the year. The plot of land is basically rested to conserve water. 
Alfalfa is the most frequent crop to be fallowed because it's the most flexible crop, meaning that it can handle a year with no water and still grow the next year. The graph on the left is evidence of this. Alfalfa fields were the first to be fallowed when water was reduced. Overall, our nation's food supply remains unaffected by the fallowed alfalfa fields, and alfalfa grown in Imperial Valley does not largely contribute to our food supply at all in the U.S. 70% of alfalfa grown in Imperial Valley of California is exported. And this brings us back to the newest May 22nd agreement in 2023, which actually pays landowners to fallow fields as a way to conserve water. This money is most likely not making its way down to the farmers who are often leasing the land. Fallowed fields mean less farmers are needed, and under the current proposed plan of compensating landowners, there's a risk to the local community to increase unemployment. This is an issue in Imperial County, which already has the high, one of the highest unemployment rates in the country. Overall, the newest agreement is a short-term solution to a long-term problem. When the agreement ends in 2026, landowners will no longer be compensated, so they'll return to exporting alfalfa to, for economic purposes. Additionally, climate change will persist, and that'll lead to the need to fallow more fields to conserve water. Overall, it's an unsustainable option to continue to subsidize landowners to fallow alfalfa fields long term. That means that there needs to be a fundamental shift to the law of the river, beginning with a restructuring of water allocations that aligns with the actual supply of the river that account for the drier future that lies ahead. There also needs to be an incentive to conserve. The use it or use it clause can't be how we manage water anymore. Finally, we need to prioritize local communities through compensated land transitions. This landscape may no longer be suitable as productive cropland, but it looks like a great area for a solar farm, which many farmers in Imperial Valley have already began to transition their alfalfa fields to. Rather than pay landowners to fallow fields, subsidizing alternatives such as solar farms in place of alfalfa fields would achieve water conservation measures while providing economic benefits to local communities. And last week I visited Imperial County to understand the landscape and community better and to capture images of the lowest reaches of the Colorado River. I took all the photos included in this presentation and to me this one was the most striking. In this picture, I'm standing where the Colorado River once flowed and what is now a dried up riverbed. Under the current policies of the Colorado River, this is what happens to the river by the time it reaches the Gulf of California. The Colorado River crisis is not just a water crisis. It's also a humanitarian crisis and an ecological crisis. Therefore, restructuring the policies that govern the Colorado River is critical to the future of water security, especially in the face of a changing climate and ongoing drought conditions in the West. Thank you. Any questions? What's alfalfa used for? It's primarily used um, as like cattle feed, and um, it's exported mainly to Asia. So there's a big issue in California with foreign investors owning land solely for the purpose of exporting the alfalfa to um, feed cattle and then have that meat sent back to the U.S. Um, a lot, it's, it can be like a controversial statement, but um, uh, like river advocates or water advocates often say that exporting a crop that water is used to grow is just the same as exporting water. I was just uh, curious if the state has tried to make it economically disadvantageous to export it with like a tax, for example? Not that I know of. Um, from my understanding, there's a pretty big agriculture like lobby in California, which is why it to me seems like it's pretty misunderstood that, um, like I said, there seems to be a big 
um, thing that if California water was cut, then it would just be this scary food shortage. And so um, I think that at all cost, California is trying to protect that industry. So not that I know of. Nice job, Sammy. Thanks. So from a policy perspective, in order to implement some of the solutions that you outlined, what would need to happen either just within the state of California or for all seven states that are basically reliant on the Colorado River? Yeah, so <clears throat> this project was really interesting because um, like I showed, I mean, I you know, thought about doing this back in the summer and the Colorado River hit news headlines like in July 2022. Um, and so all of the policies that were coming out like every couple of months were really changing the way my project was being structured. Um, and the newest one is a huge step back because when the federal government was proposing to make even cuts across the states, um, that's probably what will have to happen and now that's being delayed about three years. Hopefully it gives it time for the federal government to come up with a plan on how these um, cuts will be distributed but that would be um, me and John Fleck, who's really um, knowledgeable, all, knowledgeable about all of this, thinks that the best option would be to, for the federal government to make equal cuts across all states and then let the states figure out how they achieve those cuts. Um, I'm curious to know if you've thought about the farm worker community and how that, or these, recommendations would affect them, like if there's any workforce development that um, projects that kind of focus on maybe transitioning workforce, the workforce into something new? Um, I didn't like specifically look into it and it wasn't until I drove down to Imperial County that I saw what was happening in the land transition to solar fields, which seemed like a pretty extensive transition. Um, something that I think is really important is to remember the difference between the landowner and the farmers. It's so often argued that farmers won't be able to farm or farmers just want to farm, but when land is getting fallowed, they're not farming. And when you're paying landowners to fallow, that money isn't trickling down. And so, um, yeah, I think the solution has to be figuring out what that community is going to transition to. Okay, thank you guys.